For poet Peggy Hames, it was marveling over a pair of yard shoes. For Nicole Nordeman earlier, it's marveling over how her life and her relationship with God reflects the seasons of the earth. For William Wordsworth, it was I wandered lonely as a cloud, high floating over vale and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. For Robert Frost, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though, and he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. For Joyce Kilmer, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks to God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. And of course, there's the poet, the psalmist David, who wrote in the Psalms, When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the stars and the moon, and all that you have made, I wonder, I marvel, what is humankind that you are mindful of us? You know, are poets the only ones who marvel anymore? who still look at flowers and still look at trees and forests and snow and humanity with all of our quirks and our questions and still marvel? Is it just the poets who still marvel? And I'm wondering what causes us to lose our marvels. Marvels. <laughs> the hearing loop is being put in the sanctuary this week. I don't want anybody to go home today and think, he talked about losing our marbles today in worship service. Marvels. What causes us to lose our marvels? You know, is it knowledge? Do we know so much that very little astounds us anymore, very little awes us? Uh, while I was pastoring in Macon, we had a children's sermon one Sunday evening, a children's service on a Sunday evening. We invited a magician to come and be a part of that service. The magician thought it would be a wonderful thing if he sawed the senior minister in half up on the platform. And I was all about this because I've always wondered how you do that. But you know, once you've been sawn in half and glued back together and you know how it works, it's no big deal anymore. So I've seen a couple of magicians do it and I go, well, I know how they glue you back together. This is no big deal. No Knowledge oftentimes takes away the awe and the wonder and the marvel. I mean, once you know the trick, uh, there's not a whole lot to marvel at anymore. So here's the deal, and I, and I know we rarely think about this or talk about this or respond to Scripture in this way, but in Job chapter 38 through 40, God asks Job, Have you determined the measurements of the earth? Have you entered the springs of the sea? Have you ever dove to the depths of the ocean? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Do you know the cycles of the heaven? Do you know where the mountain goat gives birth? Have you ever watched a deer calve? Can you make the wild ox serve you? And Job obviously answered all these questions. No, those are places I haven't been, things that I don't know, things that I have not seen. But us? Uh, we answer differently, don't we? Have we measured the earth? Yes, we have. Have we entered the springs of the sea? Yes, we have. Have we dove into the oceans? Yes, we have. Have we been to the storehouses of the snow? Of course. Do we know where the mountain goats birth? Yes. Have we seen a deer calve? Yes. Do we know how long it takes? Yes. We've got National Geographic and the Discovery Channel. We know all of these things. Some people stop marveling because we know. Of course, there's a sadder reason some people stop marveling. It's not their knowledge that causes them to stop marveling. Their faith causes them to lose their marvels. In some instances, faith, and I would say misguided faith, encourages people to stop marveling, even demands that people stop marveling, calls it a sin if people do marvel. This type of faith wants to explain everything, have an answer for everything, guard those things that they consider very precious, those narrow beliefs and those narrow doctrines, and marveling becomes a bad thing. So in 1633, the chief inquisitor of Pope Urban VIII, if I'm ever a pope, I want to be Pope Urban. I think that sounds really cool. Pope Urban VIII, the inquisitor, came to Galileo, you'll remember, and asked him to recant from saying that the earth was not the center of the universe. 
and that all the planets and the sun did not revolve around the earth, but rather we lived in a heliocentric universe, and that the earth actually revolved around the sun, and the sun doesn't rise and set the way the Bible says that the sun rises and set. We're actually revolving around it, and the Inquisitor said, you're either going to recant this and stop marveling, or you're going to be in prison for the rest of your life. And Galileo would not recant. And he was under house arrest for the rest of his life and could not teach. And it was 350 years later when the church said, by the way, that's 1992, under John Paul II, when the church officially said, okay, Galileo was right. <laughs> Stop marveling. I've had several friends over the last couple of years who have gone to Kentucky to see the Ark and the Creation Museum there. They've all reported to me and attested that the whole museum is an argument against science, an argument against carbon dating, an argument against light speed theory that teaches us the distance of the stars and the age of our universe, and on and on and on. It's just arguments against marveling. But when faith asserts that dinosaurs never existed, and here's the theory, and Satan just planted those bones in the earth with fake carbon dating so that we would think they existed and think that the world was that old, then we don't get to marvel anymore at those great reptilian creatures and that era that's so mysterious to us and the power of an ice age. We lose our marvels. Both Carl Sagan and Albert Einstein in their own unique ways said this on numerous occasions. Science doesn't diminish the notion of God, but rather it gives us insight into the universe and affirms how marvelous the creation and the creator must be. It is strange and sad when faith urges us to lose our marvels. Have you lost your marvels? Has a doctrinal idea or a piece of knowledge or the breadth of your experience caused you to stop marveling at the world? Or maybe, maybe you're just like me and most of us, we're just too busy to marvel anymore. We don't, you know, we don't stop and smell the roses or gaze at the mountain or feel the breeze off the ocean or sit and enjoy the stillness of a morning lake or even just our morning backyards. How, how do we regain that sense of marveling? Maybe it's by just marveling at ourselves, at who we are as humans, kind of like the psalmist did. You know, when I look at the heavens and the work of your fingers, and when I look at the stars and the moon that you've put in place, what really amazes me, what I really marvel at, God, is that you are mindful of me. I know you think I only go to Las Vegas to play poker, but this is not true. No, 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 no. I go to Marvel. <laughs> and every time I go, I try to have some new experience while I'm there. I will leave the tournament and I'll go and do something new. One time I went to one of these medieval feasts. Have you ever been to one of those where you watch people pretend to joust and you get to eat like Cornish hens and broccoli and potatoes with your hands. They won't give you forks or anything. And that was marvelous. I marveled at all that. Uh, last year, I went to see Billy Idol at the Voodoo Lounge. That was marvelous. I marveled. <laughs> it's a new experience. My, my last trip this past year, I went to Bally's to see the Real Bodies exhibit. Has anybody seen the Bodies exhibit? A few people have. It's where they have these real live human dead bodies all dissected for you in all these different rooms you go to. It's really not as scary or gross as it sounds like. And you get to look at all the systems, like there's the digestive system room and the circulatory system room and the, the, uh, the, all the, the neurological systems room and the brain. And I just marveled at all the information that I learned. And I thought I'd share some of it with you today. <laughs> you know that your brain performs 38,000 trillion operations a second, keeping you alive and moving. And the best computers can only do about one two thousandth of that. If you took your little gray matter brain and unfolded that thing and laid it out, it covers three square feet. That's your brain. Holds five times as much information as the Encyclopedia Britannica. For those of you who are under 30, that's a set of books that's like Wikipedia. <laughs> it's kind of like Wikipedia, but in a book. 
You, you breathe enough air every day to fill seven hot air balloons. Your intestines are four to five times longer than you are tall. You produce enough saliva in a lifetime to fill two Olympic pools. Isn't that cool to think about? <laughs> you have almost 100,000 miles of veins, arteries, and capillaries in your body and about 45 miles of nerve endings. And yet not one of those facts, not one of those pieces of information, as marvelous as they are, is not worthy of our marvel like what the psalmist experienced when he thought, I am loved by God. More marvelous than any fact about my little body is that this little body and all these little bodies in this room, we are loved by God. So Claire Cloninger and Archie Jordan in the late 70s wrote a song. It was recorded by B.J. Thomas and later recorded by Amy Grant. The, the title of the song was, You Gave Me Love. The, the words, th these are the words. You gave me love when no one gave me time of day. You looked deep inside when the rest of the world looked away. You smiled at me when there were just frowns everywhere. You gave me love when nobody gave me a prayer. You gave me laughter after I'd cried all my tears. You heard my dreams while the rest of the world closed their ears. I looked in your eyes and I found a tenderness there. You gave me love when nobody gave me a prayer. That's why I call you Savior. That's why I call you friend. You've touched my heart. You touched my soul. You helped me start all over again. That's why I love you, Jesus. That's why I'll always care. Because you gave me love when nobody gave me a prayer. Marveling. But then again, Claire Cloninger and Archie Jordan are poets, aren't they? And are poets the only ones who marvel anymore? We are ending a month of creation care. And I want to encourage you as you move forward, marvel at the world that God has created for you. Marvel at the vast array of human beings around you. Don't judge them. Marvel at them. And marvel at God's love for you. Don't lose your marvels.